Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello everybody, this is Dr. Vishal Trivedi from Department of Biosciences and Bioengineering IIT Guwahati. And what we were discussing, we were discussing about the basics of biology. So in the previous lecture, we discussed about the different aspects of the living organisms. We have also discussed about the contribution of the different scientists. We have discussed about the contribution of the Aristotle and other scientists and how they have advanced this particular field of science. In addition to that, we have also discussed about the uh, what are the different criteria people are using to uh, uh, to define a particular uh, organism as the living organisms, and we have given you a, in detail a comparison of the living organisms such as the plant or the non-living uh, uh, organisms such as the uh, diesel engines, and we have given you a complete detail. Uh, you know, uh, point wise uh, comparison that how the living organism versus non living objects are different from each others. And in context to that, what we have discussed that the living organism, one of the basic property of a living organism is that it is very complex in nature. It is very diversified and in that context what we said is that if you want to understand the living organisms you have to understand the many aspects of these living organisms so what are these aspects these aspects are that uh, you are going to discuss about the classifications so we said that you have to first understand the classifications and then you have to understand how the these living organisms are evolved onto the earth and then once you understand that and if you want to understand the physiology of that particular living organisms then first you have to understand the individual cells then within the cells are made up of, of the biomolecules so you have to understand the biomolecules and uh, once you understand the biomolecules because biomolecules such as protein dna carbohydrates and lipids are actually the executory molecules so they will be responsible for the governing and regulating the different types of cellular processes and these cellular processes in combinations are actually going to impact the physiology of that particular organisms. So to start the discussing about the this particular aspects, we said that first we are going to start with the classification of the living organism. So our first question comes that what is the need to classify the living organism and why there is a what is the advantage of the living organisms? So why there is a need to classify the living organism? I think very briefly we discussed in our previous lecture that the living organism have evolved onto the earth over the millions of years which means they have gone through a very uh, you know regulated events and through which they have been evolved over the course of time and the living organism shows a wide variety of variations because of this that they are being taken huge amount of time uh, to modify it from the uh, single organism to uh, and diversified into the multiple organisms they are also showing the wide variety of variations apart from that as you recall from the previous lecture that these are also very very you know there are eight, there are approximately 8.7 million species of the living organism present on the earth and it is almost impossible that you are actually going to study and uh, you know in detail about each and every organisms and that's why it is important that you are actually going to group 
these animals into the different groups based on the similarities in the characteristics. So, if you can actually classify and if you categorize them based on the sum of the basic uh, characteristics, then it is easier to study the different groups as a whole. So, why we need to have a classification? Because classification is needed for the convenient study of the living organism. It is necessary for knowing the different varieties of the organism. So, once you classify then only you will be able to know that okay these are the properties are present in the organism belonging to category number 1 and these are the uh, organism present in the category number 2 and that is how you will be able to uh, can be able to you know understand the varieties or you can be able to understand the distinguishing factor between the two organisms. Uh, it helps in correct identification of the various organisms. So, you can imagine that if I have identified a particular organism and if it is matching or if it is showing a property which is matching with the bacteria, then you can be able to say that this is actually a bacteria. So, and that is what people do actually when they identify the new uh, species, the, when they identify the new species of an uh, living organism, what they do is they are going to do some classical experiments like they are going to do see the morphology of that particular organisms, they are going to see what is the genomic makeup of this particular organism and then also going to see what are the different types of proteins are present in that particular organism and based on these kind of analysis they will be able to identify and uh, correctly place that particular organism in that particular group. Once they place that into the particular group for example as I said you know give an example of bacteria you are actually going to know many of the basic property of that particular organism without even doing the experiments. For example, you are going to know what are the different types of physiology, what are the different types of cell makeup is going to be there, whether it is going to be unicellular or multicellular, whether it is going to have the mitochondria and all these kind of things. So, if it is a eukaryotic organisms, you will know that okay, this is going to have the eukaryotic uh, cell type of the uh, you know structures it is going to have the plasma membrane. If it is belonging to plant, then you will know that it is going to have the cell wall. Uh, then once you are going to do the classifications, it is also going to help to know the origin of that particular organism and as well as how this organism is being evolved uh, from the earlier known organisms. Uh, and that helps in determining the exact position of that organism in the classifications and ultimately it helps to develop the phylogenetic relationship between the different groups of organisms. Now, what is the advantage of the classifications? So, we have said that what are the requirement of the classifications, but what is the advantage of the classifications? There are multiple examples like multiple advantages. First is that it is actually going to give you the relationship between the different species so that the techniques developed for the one species can be used for distantly related species without much efforts. Which means if you are trying to develop a particular type of technique for a buffalo, uh, it can be used for even for the cow and as well as the goat as well because they are uh, similarly related species. Uh, one of the classical example is that suppose you are performing an experiment, right? you are performing the experiment on the monkeys and the results of these experiments can be applied onto the human without much optimization which because you know that the humans are being evolved from the monkeys and that is how people do when they are actually going to work with the drug molecules or to the vaccine candidates. For example, currently you know that we are actually facing the pandemics of the coronavirus, right? So, people are trying to identify the drugs which are responsible, which are going to, uh, you know, reduce the replication of the coronavirus or they are also have developed the vaccines. But right now, when they do not have the time to test these molecules onto the human beings, right? And do a very thorough clinical trials and so, what they are doing is they are you know testing the drugs into the related species animals like monkey or related species and then once they say that okay this particular drug is working or this vaccine is working then what they are doing is they are only doing the safety analysis they are going to do like whether this is going to be non-toxic for humans or not and whether it is going to give the protection or not right and then they are actually been releasing that particular drug or that particular vaccine for the 
human applications same is true for even if the regular drugs when they are identifying the regular drugs that also they are doing the same way right where they are trying to identify the drugs then they are actually doing the testing into the lower animals like they are going to first do the testing in mice then followed by the uh, you know followed by the monkeys uh, so, so mon uh, and then once they see that okay drug is working in the monkey because physiologically the monkey is also going to have the similar kind of physiology as like it is for the humans also and once they say okay this is working in monkey then they will be going to say okay you can use this and you can use this for the human trials. Uh, apart from that, uh, this is true for the even the plant uh, forming as well like plant forming if you are actually derived some uh, uh, you know combination of the soil or other kinds of parameters for example for the wheat the same can be used even for the maize as well because you know that the maize and the wheats are more both are monocots right so they are belonging to a same group so whatever the parameters are going to work for the wheat probably could be used for the maize because they both are monocot same is true for the rice also right so it is difficult to draw the relationship between the different species without comparing their properties and group them accordingly which so apart from that if it gives the similarity between the similar species it also can give you the contrasting features between the different groups and that is also helpful in trying to comparing the properties of the different species and grouping them accordingly. So when you have two or more species right and sharing the common traits right like for example you have the different types of uh, loins right so you can have the loin you can have tiger you can have leopards so all these are actually belonging to uh, same genus but they are also they are having the different species but they are all going to be grouped under the same genus. So if you have the prop, if you know that all these uh, species, you uh, so if since you have done the classifications, you will know the basic property of these species, right? Basic property of these uh, organisms. For example, their eating habits, right? You know all these three, like whether it is a tiger, lion, or leopard, they all are carnivora, right? Which means they are actually uh, taking the meat as their uh, source of energy and uh, all other kinds of detail also right so the first question comes is these are the you know we have seen that what is the requirement of the classifications we have also discussed what is the advantage of the classifications and now what we are going to ask is what is the way we should be able to classify the different types of living organisms as i said we have a very huge number of uh, living organisms onto the earth and uh, there should be a systematic way to classify them so that you will be able to study them uh, properly. So how to classify? You can and th th that is a very very humongous task. So you can imagine that these blocks are representing the living organism. So you can have this triangle, you can have the circle, you can have the square, you can have the three quarter uh, circle you can have the you know uh, concentric circles and so on some so these are the you can imagine that these are the different shapes of belong this these are the different shapes which are representing to the different types of organisms these shapes could also have the different types of colors so these are actually the shapes what and shape and color what is actually representing the different types of organisms and you can see that these organisms are varying in terms of shapes and in terms of the uh, different types of property for example this is blue in color this is green in color and this is red in color so these are the same shape but different uh, type properties like one is green one is blue and one is red so one the number is very small like what is that happened when in the beginning the aristotle could be able to classify the animals or classify the living organism into the two groups what it is called as the plant and animals but as you know that during that era there was no uh, discovery of microscopes there was no discover known uh, organisms which are not belonging to any of these groups so that's why the even the the organism which are very very different from the plants or the organism which are very very different from the animals uh, are actually being grouped into either of the 
plant or to the animal because these are the two things what people were uh, that time you know no knowing like for example there was no discovery of microscopes so they cannot be able to see the ultra structures and because of that they cannot be able to have the idea that okay these kind of micro uh, organisms are also present so as the number grows up this kind of classification didn't hold and the organism classified into two kingdoms like the planty and the animal but this kind of classi this type of classification was easy to do but the several organisms are difficult to classify of either of these kingdom which were because they were not be either the plant or the animals and because of that the rh whitaker have grouped the organisms using the five kingdom classifications and the basis of the classification includes so what are the different basis he has used the cellular structures so what are the different types of cellular structures are present whether the cells are uh, prokaryotic or uh, eukaryotic right so whether the cells are prokaryotic or the eukaryotic uh, whether the uh, what is the body organizations whether the cells are unicellular or uh, multicellular uh or they are you know having the even higher level of organizations like you can have the tissue or even the organs then the mode of nutrition so either they are you know acquiring the they are preparing their own food like for example the plants or they are actually been dependent on to the other organisms for example you can have the mode of nut uh, nutrition means uh, uh, on uh, how you are actually acquiring the nutritions whether it is the you know for example the plants like plants are not taking any nutrition from anywhere else right they are taking the uh, sunlight and that's how they are preparing the foods so they are self dependent whereas all other organisms are either consuming the plants or they are consuming the other animals and that the the fourth criteria what they have used is uh, the the mode of reproduction so mode of reproduction could be of two types either it could be the sexual or it could be asexual so that is the these are the four criteria and utilizing these four, four criteria the rh whitaker has uh, classified all the organism into a five kingdom classification system what are these kingdoms so in the five uh, class kingdom classifications you have the five kingdoms you have the monera you have protista you have fungi you have planty and you have the animals within the monera you have the bacteria so these these are the different types of bacteria what is present in the monera then within the protista you have the unicellular eukaryotes so these are unicellular eukaryotes then you have the fungi so when, within the fungi you have the fungus so you can see these are the fungus actually and then within the planty you have the plants so different types of plants so what you see here is a lemon plant where you have the uh, you know the lemon and all these kind of things and then within the animalia you have the all type of animals uh, in the photograph what you see is the elephants actually so these are the five kingdoms uh, people have uh, you know the uh, rh whitaker has classified so let's see what are the different properties of these uh, five kingdoms so the properties of these five kingdoms are being divided based on the different types of uh, properties so for example the cell type so these are the four or five criteria what the rh whitaker has used so as far as the cell type is concerned you have the it's a, it's a prokaryotic cell type in the case of monera it is the Uh, eukaryotic cell type in the case of all other five kingdoms whether it is the protista fungi planty or animals uh, don't worry about the why, why the cells are called as prokaryotic or eukaryotic because when we are going to discuss about the cell biology we are going to tell you in detail what is what type of cell type is called as the prokaryotic cell type and what type of cell type is called as the eukaryotic cell type then is uh, cell wall so cell wall is uh, non cellulosic which means uh, the this bacteria is going to have the cell wall but that does not contain the cellulose whereas uh, the cell wall was present in the protista as well as the fungi but and uh, 
and it is also present in the planty but the planty is does not contain the cellulosic cell wall it has a non cellulosic cell wall whereas the cell walls was completely absent in the case of the anemia then you have the nuclear membrane so nuclear membrane is absent in the uh, monera because uh, these are the prokaryotic cells and uh, whereas the cell wall was uh, nuclear membrane was present in the all other kingdoms then you have the organizations so you, these are the unicellular organisms these are also unicellular organisms fungi are multicellular organisms whereas in the plant you can have the multicellular as well as the tissue or the organ level organizations whereas in the animals you can have the uh, tissue organs or the organ system so these are the most developed type of uh, you know animals uh, or what most uh, uh, developed type of organisms present on the earth then in the type of the mode of nutrition so mode of nutrition could be autotrophic or the heterotrophic what is mean by the autotrophic is that autotrophic uh, mode of uh, nutrition means that the organism is synthesizing its own food right so it's a synthesizing uh, its own food for example the uh, plants so, so if the plants are actually taking the sunlight right and that's how the plants are synthesizing the food so that is called as the autotrophic heterotrophic means you are actually taking the uh, you know the nutrition from the other organisms whether it is a plant or whether it is the other animals or other any organisms so if you are taking from the plant then you, the an uh, organism is called as the uh, herbivora right uh, and if it is from the other animal then it is called as the carnivora right you have seen right uh, when i was talking about the uh, uh, lions they are belonging to the carnivora because they are heterotrophic animals uh, uh, but they are actually taking the nutrition from the other animals so if you are taking the meat then it is called as the carnivora if you are taking the plants then it is called as the herbivora so in the case of monera the monera is actually the bacteria so bacteria could be autotrophic because you have the some uh, bacteria which are actually been able to perform the photosynthesis and then you also have the heterotrophic bacteria because some of the bacteria are taking the nutrition from the other organism and these are the bacteria which actually causes the you know disease so all the heterotrophic bacteria are you know one or the other way they are actually causing the disease or they are taking the nutrition from the other source uh, uh, in the case of protista they are autotrophic so they are actually going to be synthesize their own food uh, example in the case of monera is the all the bacteria right unicellular bacteria whereas examples in the case of protista is the unicellular eukaryotes then you have the uh, fungi so fungi is are heterotrophic they always take the nutrition from the other sources fungi could be the you know the fungi could be pathogenic or fungi could be non pathogenic so one of the classical fungi is the mushroom right that we use for uh, edible purposes then you have the uh, plants which are exclusively been autotrophic there are plants also which are uh, heterotrophic for example the insects uh, eating plants so those insect eating plants are heterotrophic because they take the nutrition from the insects but that is partially because they only take the nitrogen from the insects uh, but they still do the photosynthesis and prepare their food uh, and then you have the animalia which is uh, heterotrophic so classical example is the human and in the case of plant the classical example is many type of plants and trees so this is the exa example i have given you the mango tree so let's discuss uh, some of the basic properties of these uh, kingdoms uh, to understand uh, what are the different properties of these kingdoms and then you will be able to understand uh, uh, more in detail about these properties so we we'll start with the kingdom monera so kingdom monera is actually the kingdom where you have the bacteria right so uh, so kingdom monera is the bacteria belongs to this kingdom monera there are further they are further divided into different categories based on the shape so you can have the cocci you can have bacillus you can have vibrio you can have the spirillium right so coca cocus cocus is going to be spherical right uh, whereas bacillus which is going to be rod shape the vibrium which vibrium is going to be a comma shape then you can have the spirillium spirillium is going to be spiral 
they can be able to grow from soil to extreme conditions such as hot springs, snow and deep oceans. The selected examples of bacterial species belonging to the different groups in the kingdom Monera is are as follows. So you can have the Archibacteria, so the bacteria belonging to these groups have distinct cell wall structure to allow their survival into the extreme conditions. Uh, these bacterial species live in harsh habitats such as extreme salty areas like the halophiles, um, hot springs like the thermoacidophiles and the marshy area such as the methanogens. Methanogens means uh, the place where you are going to have very high quantity of methane and uh, that area is very toxic but even then some of these archaebacteria are being able to uh, grow into these conditions because if you remember in the previous lecture also we have said that the living organisms are very very diversified so they could be able to change their uh, you know biochemistry they could be able to change the metabolic activities in such a way so that they can be get acquainted they can be get adjusted to the change environments. The presence of these bacterial species in the cow dung is responsible for the production of the methane or the biogas. So you can see that the archaebacteria are not only you know harmful like they are also can be used in for the industrial applications or they can be also used for the other kinds of applications where you can you know you can have the these uh, bacteria present in the cow dung and because of that the cow dung is being used for producing the biogas and that biogas people can use for the as, as a source of alternate source of fuel right. Then you can have the U bacteria. These are the true bacteria due to presence of rigid cell wall and a well defined flagellum for the mobility. Uh, several uh, species belongs to this group contain the chlorophyll A and are photosynthetic autotrophs. So the U bacteria could be autotroph or the heterotrophs. In addition, few of the chemosynthetic autotrophs actually oxidizes the various inorganic substances such as nitrate, nitrites and ammonia to generate the ATP. This property is exploited in industrial setting as well as the environment to recycle nutrients like the nitrogen, phosphorus, isor and sulfur. So the major uh, you know groups where the you know, in the in the kingdom Monera is belonging to the bacteria and this group has the you know two subgroups like the archaebacteria as well as the eubacteria and archaebacteria are not uh, you know archaebacteria are not having the uh, as you know rigid cell wall as compared to the eubacteria but and archaebacteria are very very adaptive to the harsh conditions like the salty areas hot springs marshy areas and so on and the archaebacteria are having the application in the production of biogas whereas the u bacteria u bacteria could be autotrophs or the heterotrophs and or u bacteria are uh, also having the application that they can be able to release the inorganic substances such as nitrate nitrites and ammonia from the organic compounds and uh, that's how they can be able to utilize this so you can imagine that if you are generating the toxic chemical substances then these bacteria can be utilized to neutralize these substances to release the inorganic substances and that can be used for detoxifying or neutralizing the effects of the organic substances. Then we will talk about the protista. So the kingdom protista is all unicellular or eukaryotes belonging to kingdom protista. The organism in this group has well defined nucleus. So that is very important to know right compared to the monera where you which is actually uh, prokaryotic uh, cells uh, the mon protista is going to be a eukaryotic cells. So you can imagine and you know that you know if you know the classification you can easily know that uh, uh, the pro protista are actually probably been de developed from the uh, you know the from the monera because they they have somehow the initially the prokaryotes are being evolved or prokaryotes are being developed and then eventually the prokaryotes got converted into eukaryotes uh, and the other membrane like bound organelles these organelles have the mixed property of plant fungi and animals and considered to be responsible for linking organism in other kingdoms. Protista reproduce mostly by asexual means 
and sexually with their self use and zygote formations so the kingdom the molecules or uh, the organism present in the kingdom protista are mostly been uh, you know reproducing utilizing the, by the asexual means uh, but they sometime also reproduce by the sexual means by where they can actually have the self use and, and the zygote formations the selected example of these groups are as follows so you can have the chrysophytes so chrysophytes are the diatoms and the golden brown algae belonging to this groups these organisms are present in water and float passively so they are not free flowing what um, organism but they you know they are in the uh, not a running water but a stagnant water so they will floating into the surface and the diatom has the silica cell wall and they accumulate the silica in the uh, they accumulate in the ocean to give the diatomaceous earth diatomaceous earth is a very very valuable item because that is can be used for you know con for ma making the polish as well as the filtrate of oil and syrups so that is very very useful in terms of the industrial setup where they can be used for making the uh, polish and they can also be used to filter the oil and the syrups then you can have the dinoflagellates so dinoflagellates these are the photosynthetic marine organism of different color depending upon the pigment present in their cell wall the cell wall has cellulose on its outer surface most of the dinoflagellate have two flagella attached to their cell body red dinoflagellates multiplication in ocean and give the red color so the because of that you have the color of that particular water body then you can have the eugenoids Euglena is the representative organism belonging to this particular group these are the photosynthetic organisms and they perform the photosynthesis in the presence of sunlight in the absence of sunlight for cause you know you can always have the alternate mode of nutrition so if the sunlight is present the euglena is going to synthesize its own food because it has the photosynthetic pigments and it can have the full machinery to synthesize that but if the there is a sun no sunlight because suppose it goes deeper into the ocean and or suppose it, it there is no sunlight right because sometime the 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 surface of the, uh, the water body is going to be covered with the you know oil or some kind of leaves then in that case there will be no sunlight right so in the absence of sunlight it catches the tiny prey and behave like a heterotroph the cell body has a protein rich layer pellicle and it gives the flexibility to the organism so it has a cell body which is called as the pellicle and that pellicle is actually give the flexibility into the organisms apart from that you have the slimy molds slimy molds are saprophytic protists means which means so what is mean by the saprophytic is that they actually acquire the nutrition by dissolving the food molecules so that anyway we are going to discuss in detail in later on that what is the different mode of nutrition taking the nutrition so one is called saprophytic then you have the holophytic and so on so they feed on the organic matter from the decaying twigs and the fish uh, leaves during unfavorable conditions they form the spores which are resistant and survive in the extreme conditions spores of these organisms can survive for several years and will be dispersed by air so slime molds are saprophytic in nature so they can be able to take the nutrition from the decaying organic matters then you have the kingdom planty so kingdom planty means it this is the kingdom where you have the plants right so all the multicellular green plants are part of the kingdom planty their cell wall is made up of of the cellulose mostly these organisms are photosynthetic but the few insect eating plants are parasitic in nature which means you have the you know the, the insect eating plants and these are called as insectivora so and the insect insect eating plants and these take up the nutrition from the insects so they trap the insects and uh, if you can you know have a chance you can actually go to the youtube and you can see the very wonderful video where you can see the sundew plant and all other kind of plants how they actually catch the insects uh, plants reproduce through asexual vegetative propagation and as well as the sexual methods 
plants are either bisexual which means they are going to have the uh, bisexual or they can be having the unisexual which means they are going to have the separate male and female plants. Uh, plants are further divided into the different subgroups like bryophyta, pteridophyta, gymnosperm and angiosperm. So, these are the things we are going to discuss in detail. So, we are not going to uh, you know discussing the properties of the different plants belonging to bryophyta, pteridophyta, gymnosperm and the angiosperms. Now the kingdom animalia, so kingdom animalia is the these organisms are heterotrophic which means they are going to take up the nutrition from the other organisms and uh, they are multicellular eukaryotes without a thick cell wall. So they are going to only having the plasma membrane, they depends on the plants for the nutrition, sometimes they also take up the nutrition from the other organisms. So, uh, they have the digestive system, so they have a well developed physiology where you, they can have the separate digestive system, they can have the circulatory system and they can have the well defined sensory as well as the neuromotor mechanisms. These organisms have a defined developmental pattern to acquire the defined shape and size in the adults which means these organisms have the different developmental stages through which they are actually going to go through and these uh, and that is how they so they will be very different when they are going to bond and uh, they will go through with the different developmental stages and that is how they are actually going to acquire the stage of the adults. Reproduction in the, the organism is um, a sexual mechanism as well as in some cases it is also asexual. So, uh, it is a if it is a sexual mechanism they are actually going to have the separate male and the female. Apart from these five uh, kingdoms, so apart from these uh, five kingdoms, uh, you can also have the some of the organisms which are not belonging to these uh, five kingdoms. So these are the special organisms which does not have the uh, any kind of groups, but they are actually not falling into these five kingdoms. So what are these organisms? These organisms are not being able to place into these kingdoms because they do not have the any of the properties uh, you know common to these uh, earlier five kingdoms. What are these organisms? These are the viruses. So, these are the non-nucleated and acellular organisms. So, that actually makes them the unique set because since they are non-nucleated you cannot classify them into the monera or protesta and since they do not have the cellular organism also they cannot be classified into any other uh, kingdoms. Viruses can be stored for years as particle and they are considered to be false living organisms. Okay? So, they sometimes people are also saying that they are not even the living organism, but that is not true. They are living organisms, but they are false living organisms. They depend on the host organisms to provide the cellular machinery for the multiplications. And because of this feature only, they are being considered as the false living organism. So, you can store them in the bottle, you can store them in your um, you know in a in a box uh, for years and they will not going to have any problem. But as soon as you open and they will come into contact to the uh, host organism, they will be good going to utilize that host organism and they will going to multiply. They contains the genetic materials like the DNA or the RNA and they are also going to have the protein cores and because of this only they are considered as the living organisms. Post infection they integrate into the genetic material, they, they, they integrate their genetic material into the host genome to control the cellular machinery of the host. Virus can use the bac bacteria, plants or animal cell as a host. They are mostly pathogenic and be responsible for diseases in bacteria, plant and animal. Right? You are still you know very much familiar with the virus like the coronavirus which is utilizing the nutrition from the animals uh, from the humans right. Viroids, so T.O. Danner discovered these organisms which do not they only contain the free RNA. They are smaller than virus, it does not contain the protein code as found in the virus. So, viroids are the even smaller than viruses. Then you have the lichens. As discussed previously, right, the algae and fungi are associated to give an organism known as the lichen. In this organism, the algae is 
फाइकोबायोंट एंड बी रिस्पॉन्सिबल फॉर प्रिपेयरिंग द फूड वेयर एज द फंजाई आर द एब्जॉर्बिंग मटेरियल एंड वाटर सो द लाइकन इज ए कॉम्बिनेशन ऑफ द एलगी एंड फंजाई एंड दे बोथ आर कमिंग टूगेदर एज अ सिम्बॉइंट यू नो ऑर्गेनिजम्स and uh, where the algae is actually preparing the food but it cannot you know it cannot prepare the food until it actually be able to you know absorb the uh, minerals as well as the water so that is been the part of the fungi the association between the both counterparts help each other and this kind of association is known as the symbiont relationship or symbiont rel so lichens are very sensitive to pollution as they don't grow in the high pollution area so that's why the lichens are called as the pollution indicators so you will not find the lichens in those area where the pollution is very high and that's why the when these uh, pollution monitoring agencies sometime what they do is they actually goes into the particular area and they look for whether the lichens are present in that area or not if the lichens are not present then they know that the pollution area is very very high then the because we are just talk about the you know the classifications so classification we have just discuss about the kingdom up to the kingdom level right but the, beyond the kingdom also or within a single kingdom also the organisms are also been uh, categorized into the different taxonomic categories so what are these these categories you have the species you have the genus you have the family you have the order you have the class and then you have the phylum or the division and then you have the kingdoms so the smallest unit is the species and the largest unit is the kingdom so what is species so we'll go in the reverse order order actually species these are the group of organism with the fundamental similarities species is the smallest unit in the taxonomic classification for example the human belongs to the species which is called as the sapiens then the similar species come together and that's how they are actually going to constitute a genus so genus comprises the similar species which have the common features for example you have the lion leopard and you know the tigers these are come together under a single genus which is called as the panther so within the panther you could be different in terms of species so you can be different in terms of species like the lion species leopard and the panther but it could be under the same genus which is called as the panther then the genus the different types of genus when they come together they are actually been grouped under a family so individual order is divided into different families based on the different genera for example plants are placed in different families based on the reproductive feature of that particular plant uh, so within the family you have the genus and within the genus you have the species then all the families are been placed under the order so each class is divided into the different order based on the aggregate of characters each class contains the different families for example the order carnivora right so order carnivora is actually going to include the families like philidae and can cid philidae is the family where you are going to have all the uh, in all the you know cats then the orders when come together they are actually going to constitute the class so different classes are present within the single phylum for example within the phylum chordata we have the individual classes for the fishes amphibians and reptiles so these fishes amphibians and reptiles are the different classes within the fishes you can have the different orders family genus and species similarly within the amphibians reptiles and so on so class is uh, even higher taxonomic uh, category compared to the order then you have the phylum so different organism with the similar properties are placed in phylum for example the phylum chordata comprises the animal containing the central notochord for example the fishes amphibians reptiles birds humans uh, then all the phylums are placed under the which are actually having the different similar properties so kingdom is the highest taxonomic category and all organisms are placed in a particular kingdom based on the gross properties for example the all these uh, uh, 
uh, fishes, amphibians, reptiles, birds will come under the uh, kingdom which is called as the Animalia. So, since we, they have the different types of taxonomic categories, you can also use this particular phenomena to give the name of that particular uh, animals because as you know that we have also name right for example my name is Vishal Tavedi right but this is not a scientific name right although even then in, in this name also there is a particular pattern what we are following right um, I am following like this is my family name and this is my first name right so this is my family name and this is my first name right so same but this is still not a scientific uh, way of writing the name of the every uh, every organism. So, every organism is actually going to follow a scientific way in which its name is going to be uh, you know given in the in the textbooks. So, what is the rule for making a nomenclature of a living organism? The taxonomic classification is used for the nomenclature of a particular organism. The most popular method of naming organism is known as the binomial system. So, binomial system which involves the formation of genus and the species. So, in a uh, binomial system, you can have the name with the two component. One is called as the genus and the other is called as the species. And this system is being proposed by Car Carlos Linnaeus. And Carlos Linnaeus actually utilizes this system and he has actually given the name to all the uh, gene, all the organisms which were present at that time where you are actually going to use the genus as the first and the species as the first letter uh, second letter to give the nomenclature of the individual organism so you are going to use the genus as the first letter and a species as the second letter for being the nomenclature of a living organism let's take an example for example if you want to give the scientific name of a human it could be a name right it could be a Vishal Trivedi uh, like my name or it could be any other name right but uh, if you talk about the scientifically the humans are actually belonging to a genus which is called as the homo and then it is belonging to a species which is called as the sapiens and that's why the humans scientific name is going to be homo sapiens here the homo is the genus of that particular species and the sapiens is the species. In case that um, what is the problem? Problem is that you might actually having an organism which is actually having the same genus and the same species. So what how you are going to distinction? So if the in case the two organisms have the similar species but they belong to different subspecies, then in that case you are actually going to keep the species name as well as the subspecies also. Like for example, you can have the Homo sapiens sapiens so that is that third sapien what you see is actually a subspecies within the homo sapiens you can also have the subspecies or you can have the homo sapiens some other uh, subspecies so in addition name of the other author appear at the end of the biological name for example you can have the scientific name of mango so mango mango scientific name is mangifera indica mangifera is the genus right and the indica is the species but what you see here is the lin so its complete name is mangifera indica lin and what is the third name third name is the name of the author who has actually discovered the mango for the first time and since the carlos linnaeus has discovered the uh, mango for the first time he has actually put his initials at the end so that's why the scientific name of the mango is mangifera indica lin so this is what the way of the scientific way of actually giving the nomenclature of the living organism this is different from your common name or this is different from the your social name this is a scientific name for example when you write about the mango mango is a common name but if you try to describe the mango into the textbooks it is going to be mangifera indica lin so with this, I would like to conclude my lecture. But before we conclude, let's discuss what are the different portion what we have discussed, what we have discussed so far in this uh, lecture. So what we have discussed, we have discussed about 
what is the importance of classification what is the reason and the need to classify the different organisms and how the people have tried to classify the different types of organisms for example the aristotle the aristotle has you know classified the organisms into the two parts like plant or animals uh, later on the people have realized that the organisms are neither falling into the plant uh, category or the animal category so they were actually have used the five kingdom systems and within the five kingdom systems uh, they have actually you know found out the different types of properties and characteristics and based on these characteristics they have classified the different types of organism into the different kingdoms and apart from that we have also discussed about the different types of taxonomic categories what we are using and the last we have also discussed about the uh, scientific nomenclature of these organisms so with this i would like to conclude my lecture here in a subsequent lecture we are actually going to discuss about the classification of the animals and uh, uh, and we are also going to discuss about the classification of the plants so with this i would like to conclude thank you